is it safe? Hello, uh, hello Purple Fire. My name is Maxwell Shad, and I'm here with James Ray. We're presenting Machining 101 for the Purple Fire Spring 2021 workshops. Uh, let's get right start. Let's get right into it. So the first machine we're going over is the laser engraver. The laser engraver is a relatively large machine in the workshop that uh, you can use to precisely cut and burn away material from uh, a wide variety of different types of materials. Um, so the way that it works is you take a PDF file from a desired cut pattern and you upload it into the laser engraver software. You can get this type of file from all sorts of different platforms. You can pull an image from Google Images. You could convert a SOLIDWORKS file into a PDF. Um, and what it does is it traces an outline on the materials top surface. And then you can use that to create specific technical parts or you can use it to create art. Uh, in the next slide here, we've got a couple examples of that. So here on the left, we've got a award that John Newton printed in the machine shop using the laser engraver. And then there's also a big gear here that he made. On the right, I've got these necklace pendants that I made back in high school using a similar laser engraver. Uh, I spray painted these after cutting them, so you can use a lot of different methods with this. It's super flexible. Uh, John has a lot more information on, let me go back to it, uh, on how to specifically use this machine to make sure that you're operating it safely. Uh, certain power settings will, could uh, create a fire if you're not careful because it's a uh, laser burning away material. So if you're using cardboard or wood, um, there is a potential hazard. Um, certain other materials uh, could create toxic uh, toxic gas when you burn them. So again, uh, talk to John about how to use this machine safely. You can use it for a lot of different things though. So definitely check that out if you uh, want to use this. Um, yeah, it has a lot of different opportunities for machining. Uh, the next thing we're going to get into here is the drill press. The drill press is used for making holes in material. Um, so it's a lot more precise than a hand drill. Uh, usually the way that you put holes into materials with a vice grip on that uh, middle base plate here. Um, and then you use the crank up on the top right to lower the drill bit down into the material. It can be about as precise as you're willing to make it. So generally more precise than a hand drill. Um, it can be about as precise as a manual mill, but you're going to usually use it for less precise uh, jobs, uh, a lot more quick jobs that uh, you just want to put a hole in a, in a piece so that it can fit into something relatively simply. Um, doesn't need to be super precise. It would be good enough for most applications where say you have like a block or a part and it just needs to fit into something else and it's not something that needs to be super precise. You can just toss it into this and make sure that it's lined up and then you'll be good to go by lowering the drill bit onto it. You can put different size drill bits into it and get different size holes. It's pretty simple to use. So again, uh, for safety, make sure you're talking to John before you go and use this for the first time. If you've never used one before, um, and that goes for all the things in the machine shop. Talk to John. He knows what he's doing. He's been a machinist for longer than any of us have even been alive. So yeah, um, he he can also help you with other machines, um, but in these two specifically, like he knows what he's doing and he uh, he can help you get on where you need to go. So uh, the next one's going to be with James. Let's see what's next. All right, the manual mill. So the manual mill and the one that John has is bridge ports, which are very common uh, brand just because they were built in the 60s and they last forever. Um, these machines are a three axis mill. What they do is they uh, are designed for removing material with great precision. What they are, the way they're operated is you use passes with something called an end mill. I'm going to skip to the next slide so you can see what I'm talking about. These mill end mills here, you can see unlike drill presses below them, um, drill bits below them, sorry, words, drill bits below them have a uh, sharp point. 
manual uh, end mills have a flat surface. So what you can do is pass over material to remove it with great precision. Like you can make a part perfectly flat to within a thousandth of an inch. So whatever next maneuver you're going to do, you can rely on the part being very precisely machined so it doesn't throw off your next uh, whatever process you're going to do. Um, now, Max mentioned before that you can use this mill for drilling as well, and you totally can. It is, uh, again, accurate to within a thousandth of an inch for very high precision parts. So you can put drill bits into this and uh, put extremely accurate holes in them. What's interesting is when you use this machine, you realize that drill bits are not really that straight. They tend to be a little bent and not perfect. So it's common to uh, like plunge a hole with a drill bit and then make it larger with an end mill that's the right size. All right, so I'm going to jump into this quick. This applies to the mill and the lathe, which I'm going to go over next. The tools that are used are either what we call carbide or high speed steel or HSS for short. Now carbide is anything you're going to see out of this shinier material here. They're little bits that you insert to a larger holder. Um, and high speed steel just comes in a chunk that you can grind yourself to make a tool. Now, um, you're going to hear these words thrown all around a lot when you learn about machining because there are different kinds of materials that you can use for cutting. Carbide, it says here, has higher temperature resistance and it's harder than high speed steel, but these parts tend to be a little bit more expensive. However, you can cut faster through different materials and cut through harder materials with less difficulty. Uh, high speed steel is much cheaper. Uh, like I said before, you can make the tool yourself. You don't have to buy a little insert. Um, and it is softer, so it's not going to go through harder materials as well. But for anything that most people would be doing, HSS is enough. Carbide is just kind of like a nice premium material if you're going to, if you like cutting faster, whatever you're doing. Now, um, these are little pictures I tried to find that show what milling looks like in general. Like these are passes that you're making. The one right here on the left that's uh, blown up. Uh, he's making an extremely deep pass. I would not recommend doing it like that, but um, you can see what he's doing is he's running the mill and just progressing the end mill into a piece of material and it's chipping it away. And you can see over here one is not running, but you can still see those grooves where clearly it was lowered into the material and passed horizontally through it. Okay, the manual lathe. This is not what the manual lathe looks like in the uh, shop, but it's a lot easier to tell what parts are on this than a picture of a much larger lathe from a distance. But essentially what a lathe does is unlike a mill, the part is what turns in a lathe and then your tool is what's stationary. Um, you usually make circular parts on this, obviously because your part is turning. That's really the only way you can make parts, but you can make squared pieces if you do passes in a very specific way. That's more advanced stuff, but you can learn that stuff if you want to. Um, most tools are used to either flatten a surface, reduce diameter, you can chamfer edges, drill holes, parallel surfaces. You can do all sorts of stuff with the lathe. They're very, very capable machines. Okay. Here are some pictures I tried to find. Um, right here on the left, you can see someone reducing the diameter of a part as the machine spins and the tool moves to the left. On the right, you can actually see a part I was making on the lathe in the one in the shop. And you can see the tool right there to the left and black underneath the orange thing, uh, progressing inwards towards the center of rotation, taking out material as it goes. Um, this was cutting titanium, which is a very hard material to cut. And that's why you can see the little insert right there made of carbide. It's not hard. It's not easy to see everything in here. I understand that. Um, but this is a situation where you want to use carbide over high speed steel. Okay, so manual lathe tools. Now you'll actually understand more of what I'm talking about. Um, these are the kinds of tools you use. You see a lot of them have these odd shapes that go straight out and then curl to the left. And all of these are carbide tools where they have a little insert that goes at the end. Um, they're usually driven across the surface of a part to remove material one axis at a time. Um, single point tools are shown with the golden bits here. Let's see what we have next. I threw in a little picture here. This might help you understand what's going on. This is a side view of one of those tools where you have in green, the majority of the material is just to support the carbide insert. 
or the cutting edge if it's a HSS. Either way, your cutting edge takes up a small amount of material and the rest of it's just to support that weight. And these angles here are cut to get everything else that's not cutting out of the way. So you can see how these are slopes to get most of the tool out of the way of the cutting edge. Oh, that one quick. Sorry um, about that. Yeah, so here we've got just extra resources and also a reference that I had on mine. So the art that was on that necklace pendant, I didn't come up with that. I took that image uh, from online and turned it into a PDF that a laser engraver could read and then did up the art a bit to make it look a lot prettier. Um, and then these YouTube resources here, James put in to have extra information that you could look up on YouTube. Uh, these are people who make stuff with their machines in their machine shops, and you can use these for ideas of what you could make with your own processes uh, that we have access to, to here at Poly. Um, yeah, and I highly recommend go to room 1016 and talk with uh, John Newton, who loves teaching students. So don't go in there thinking he doesn't want to teach you. He absolutely loves teaching you. Um, when it comes to the YouTube resources, you can access those at any time. This will be through those in there. If you're interested in machining, you may have already heard of these two people, um, but they make very engaging videos that teach you a lot about different types of machining, not just like milling and uh, working on the lathe, but like welding and uh, material science, all sorts of very interesting stuff in a way that's quite engaging. So you can learn about that if you want to. Um, I think that is all we've got that went very quickly. So if we have questions, that would be amazing. We talk fast. And if there isn't any questions, then I think we could call it here in about a minute or so. Should we start making up wrong questions? <laughs> Dylan, what do you think? Do you have anything? No, I don't. All right. Well, I'm glad we didn't schedule it for an hour. That is good. I just want to see if there's anything we might have skipped over in here that we can dive into a bit more. There's certainly more machines in the machine shop than what we just pictured here. I took a picture of the machine. Uh, well, this is from the machine shop. This is like what's actually in there, uh, this laser engraver. Um, and just like around the back wall, if you haven't been in there, uh, it is the end of the semester right now, but come next semester, there is plenty of opportunity to go in there and look at just what you have access to. Like I said, a lot more machines than we went over today. Um, there's great opportunities there for making things. Personal projects are huge at the university and moving forward into a career with internships and all that. So getting in here is a great idea to start moving forward in engineering careers uh, and degrees. So there's definitely that to consider. Could you talk a little bit about the kind of process that someone would go through if they have something in their mind that they want to machine from the idea to having a completed product that they made in the machine shop? Um, well, let's start. Can we fire up the camera quick? I've got a piece that, a little widget that you have to make to. Uh, oh. Sure. Wait, let me uh, change my background from, what's it, a uh, Canyon Large? <laughs> Actually, it's just you. Yeah, just, yeah. just there we go. blur me out. Oh, hey, there we are. OK, uh, Dylan, tell us when it's visible. You're good. Okay. All right, so I don't know how well this shows up on camera. I'm sorry if it doesn't, but this is a little, John calls it a widget. Um, it's just a piece of round aluminum that you do a bunch of different processes to, to learn how to use the machines. You can see, I don't know if you can see, there's uh, threading on the outside. You bore a hole of different depths. You go make a horizontal pass. You knurl the outsides. So you can get a grip on it. Um, Various different things you do, tap the inside as well, put threads on the inside hole. That um, it's your machine shop training two, which teaches you to use machines. So John knows that you at least have an idea of what you're doing. So that's the first step of wanting to make something in the shop. The second would be, I say, uh, going to talk to John once you have an idea of what you want to do, ideally a bit of a drawing. So he understands what you're talking about and he can help you put together like a dimensions for that drawing. So he gets a better idea of what you're trying to make. And so when you're referring to this drawing, when you're trying to make it, it's less likely you'll mess up if you have good dimensions. What yeah, one of, one of the things that they cover in skills and design courses is that um, 
having an accurate design to a part that you're going to make, it's not necessarily 100% required, but having that is super helpful because you know, OK, this piece needs to be exactly this long so I can use these tools to make that job done however big I want or however small I want it. Um, also, specific processes can be used if you know, OK, so this is a flat face on a part that's uh, overall from like a rounded material uh, or like a rounded workpiece. Uh, so you can consider that into, OK, well, I want to put it into the manual mill because I know I can run a horizontal pass on it and just remove uh, some of the material and make a flat face I need um, while leaving the rest of it that rounded shape. So there's a lot of like that thought process and John is really good at telling you, OK, this looks like this from a drawing to you need to use this machine to make that thing. Um, and having a drawing from uh, some software of your part, uh, going in there with that first is really helpful. Um, and then from there, he can help you get to where you need to go. Yeah, um, I would say also what's uh, pretty fun is no matter what pro, no matter what project or part you're making, you're going to need to use multiple machines and multiple processes, so you can refine various different steps in the process, which is very fun. Um, any project you're going to do, like I was making rings, jewelry out of titanium, and I had to use a variety of different machines just to make literally a tiny hoop. Like there was many steps I had to do in polishing and sandblasting and uh, working on the lathe mostly. But um, it can be a lot of fun to go in there and just takes a hunk of metal and turn it into something useful. It's plenty of fun and it teaches you a lot about how what I think is really important with the engineering program you need to be able to design things that can be, be built. It's common to come across engineers who can't design something that can be built when you're working in industries. So being able to bridge that gap is extremely important um, when you become an engineer. Yeah. I think that is all we've got unless we can come up with more stuff. Unfortunately, you can't learn a lot of this until you use the machines. That's why this is kind of short. Mm -hmm. I wish we could go on more about this. I, I love this stuff, but. Uh, Dylan, what do you think? Sounds good to me. All right. So I think we can call it. That is, yeah. All right, if that's it, we'll uh, leave. Dylan, do you cut the meeting off or do we just like.